Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary and Lake Havasu. Today, we are wrapping up our Kingdom Relationship Series with a message about grace and conflict. If you'd like to grab your Bible, we will be looking at John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. To follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Chad Garrison. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab a Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 8. John 8 is our text, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1062. That's page 1062. And you will find John chapter 8. You'll be able to follow along with us. And if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. Uh, we really mean that because we want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We'll be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I'm excited. Uh, I know it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm glad you guys are here uh, and uh, praying for the people who are out there. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great time to celebrate. It's a great time to say thank you for the people who gave their lives for the freedom of our country. And it's a great time to thank God for giving us freedom through his son. Because Jesus said, if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. So, uh, and, and I'm excited because next weekend is going to be uh, just epic in the life of Calvary. First of all, on Saturday at 9 o'clock over at our McCulloch campus, we we're having our annual business meeting. Some of you are like, going to miss that one. <laughs> don't want to go to a business meeting. Don't want to ever go to a business meeting. Hey, uh, we don't do business like other churches. I mean, it's, it's always exciting. It's encouraging. But we are talking about expansion. We are talking about the fact that, uh, you know, during the high season when everybody was in town, uh, you know, we were out of space uh, again and again and again in uh, this facility. We're going to talk about addressing that in the future and what we're going to do in the plans. We'd love for you to come and listen in and uh, take part in that if you would like to. That's 9 o'clock Saturday, June 3rd. And then Sunday, June 4th, Pastor Sean already mentioned it. Mentioned it. We are doing lake baptisms and uh, my favorite day of the year, we're going to meet down, and, and, it, and you know, it's not even going to be that hot. I mean, the water will probably still be cold to us, because it won't be 110 degrees outside. <laughs> but, uh, but we're going to get to celebrate people's declaration of faith in Jesus in a public venue. We've already got uh, 23 people signed up right now. And uh, God willing, we'll double that or more. So uh, if you're thinking about it, if you're praying about it, if you're wondering, should I? The answer is yes. And uh, grab one of those connect cards, fill it out, and tell us Lake Baptism, and we will uh, get in contact with you this week and touch base. So, uh, and, uh, and then next week, we're beginning a, a series on 1 Corinthians. Uh, and if you haven't read 1 Corinthians or you're like, uh, I know it's somewhere in the Bible, I just don't know where. It is an amazing letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to an incredibly dysfunctional church. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Lots of problems, lots of conflicts, lots of real life issues that are relevant to today and resulted in some of those powerful, controversial, and well-known passages of Scripture. When we get to them, we go, oh, I know where that is. Yeah, I know that one. So I uh, hope you'll be joining us in that. Today, we're wrapping up our Kingdom Relationship Series, and we pray that it has blessed you, no matter what your relationship status is currently. So in your relationships, do you ever have conflict? Anyone? So if you don't have any conflict in your relationships, you might be a little boring, but we'll talk about that later. Hey, here's the thing. I never mind substantial conflict. You know, when you're having conflict over the big decisions, over the big stuff, over the things that matter. But can I just tell you, it drives me crazy to have those unnecessary, what I call just stupid conflicts. I mean, when we first got married, uh, Merelda and I had conflict over the most ridiculous things. Like... Are we going to buy white or wheat bread? Okay, how many white bread people are in the room? You can confess it here. It's okay. How many wheat bread people are in the room? Oh, yeah, wheat bread wins, but I don't care. I'm still going to buy white bread because it still tastes better. How, uh, or we fought about mayonnaise or Miracle Whip. All right. So how many mayo people are in the room? Uh, how many Miracle Whip people are in the room? Yeah, see, I'm a Miracle Whip person. I, I'm in the minority on a lot of these things, I see. I was in the minority in my two-person relationship, too. 
How about, how about creamy or crunchy peanut butter? How many, were, how many are crunchy? Come on, let's see your hands. How many are creamy? All right, that's kind of split right down the middle. Creamy makes better sandwiches. I'm just going to say it doesn't rip the bread apart, especially if it's white bread. <laughs> but the biggest conflict we had early in our marriage, and, I'm, and I hate to say this, but it's like the epitome of stupid conflict, was the definition of a picnic. <laughs> One day, she says to me, hey, let's go on a picnic. And I said, sure, let's go on a picnic. And, and the problem was that we had two different definitions of what a picnic meant. Just completely and totally. They were not the same, you know, anywhere in the same neighborhood, much less reality. So for me, a picnic was, hey, let's jump in the car, let's grab KFC, let's, you know, eat some, right? You eat some greasy chicken, you wipe your hands on your clothes, and then you go play football or hike or do something fine. It's all about the, the play, okay? It's, it's eating outside so you can play quicker. For Merelda, a picnic was uh, something out of Gone with the Wind. <laughs> had to put on special clothes. She actually had a picnic basket I didn't even know about. And you're supposed to fill the containers with the elements for food, but you, you not, it's all, you gotta build it when you get there, but it's all gotta look right. And then you, and then you have to go and you have to find the right spot and you spread the, the blankets. I didn't even know we had blankets for picnics, but apparently we did. <laughs> And then you have to pose for photo ops that, that we weren't even people doing social media back then. And, and you can just see, we just clashed because, so I, I will just say this, we have eaten outside numerous times, but we have never gone on a picnic. Because uh, <laughs> uh, we still can't really agree what it looks like. Well, today we're talking about conflict, but we're, it, it, it's not you know, that silly conflict of the stuff that we fight about in ridiculous ways. We're looking at a powerful story of conflict and grace. And, and I want you to notice as we read this, the people and the relationships that are in this story. Uh, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard this before, but if you haven't, this is going to be a new and probably shocking account. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, says, But Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? This they said to test Jesus, that they might find some, have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down, and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What an amazing account that is full of twists and surprises. I mean, the supposed good guys are evil. The sinner is sympathetic, and Jesus just shocks everyone with what he does. And, and here's the challenge as we go through this uh, passage, as we talk about this in the context of relationships, I want to challenge you to find yourself in the story. Because I think we all have a place in this story. We all can identify with someone in this story, sometimes multiple people. But I want you to try to find yourself in this story of grace in conflict. Because some that are here and some in the story need to understand the grace of God. Some need to understand the grace of God. Now, I'm talking about the scribes and the Pharisees in the story. They needed to understand grace because they did not get it at all. I mean, they were, they were grace clueless. I mean, they're the religious elite. They've devoted their lives to studying Scripture and supposedly serving God. 
They are respected and held in high esteem by people, but they are incredibly unpopular. I mean, everybody's like, oh, they're Pharisees. Yeah, they're important. They're spiritual. I don't like them. And, the reason, and there was a reason they didn't like them. They were unpopular because their version of religion was toxic. It was unhealthy. And, and if you don't know what toxic religion looks like, let me spell it out for you. Uh, your religion is toxic if you misuse Scripture to try to prove that you're right. See, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were misusing Scripture to try to trap Jesus. Now, they were, well, that's what they were trying to do. Verse 6 tells us they were doing this to try to you know, trap Jesus into making a mistake where they could either accuse him of being just like them, willing to condemn a woman uh, and, and have her executed, or being soft on a sin, and then they could drag him before the council and, and uh, put him to death. So they're trying to trap Jesus, and, and they say with great pomp and piety, verses 4 and 5, the law, now in verse 5, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They appeal to the law. They say the law says we're to put her to death. The law says you're supposed to do this. And, and by the way, uh, do you think they were concerned about the law? No. Yeah. They weren't really concerned about the law at all because the law says in Leviticus 20.10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. What's missing? Yeah, the dude is missing. Last time I checked, to commit, to be caught in the act of adultery takes more than one person. Okay, I mean, that's just like, okay, if you're in the act where that means there were two people, where is the guy? They didn't care. They didn't care about the guy. I mean, maybe they set this woman up. I mean, there's lots of theories about why they left the guy alone, but they just were taking the person, one, one person, the woman, and trying to make a, her the issue, not the guy. Jesus knows that they are abusing Scripture. That's what toxic religion looks like. They just want to abuse Scripture to win the moment. And your religion is toxic if you use people to win an argument. Now, it's wrong to use people anytime. But they were, trying, they were using this woman to try and trap Jesus, even if it meant she had to die. Do you, do you realize the, how callous they were towards her life? She's like, yeah, she's guilty. We're going to kill her. We're going to kill her. We're going to execute her. They, they, there was no, you know indication that they valued her as someone who was made in the image of God and loved by God and valued by God at all. They were just like, okay, we're going we're gonna to use her, and if she dies, she dies. She was just a pawn in their trap. And by the way, it's wrong to use people, whether that's using them for your pleasure or your gain or to win an argument, but it is evil to use people and consider it serving God. Let me be really clear about that. It is evil for people who are saying, we represent God, we're the religious elite, we're the holy ones of Israel, and they're using a woman to try and trap Jesus, and they don't care if she lives or dies. Can I just say, if you value winning arguments more than winning friendships, you need to get grace. You need to understand grace. If your faith tells you it's okay to use people, you need to understand grace. You see, the Pharisees, the scribes, they believed that they were morally superior to Jesus. Understand, they believed they were morally superior to the Son of God, the Savior of the world, God in the flesh, who's right before them. They thought they were ahead of him spiritually, and they were winning this, this battle. They thought they had Jesus trapped. And then uh, Jesus said, let him who is without sin among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, the law says that she's guilty of being stoned to death, and he basically says, go ahead and stone her, but uh, make sure that you're guiltless before you cast that stone. Make sure that you uh, are without sin if you're going to be the one who starts this execution event. Um, and so while the Pharisees were busy condemning the woman, Jesus reminds them that they are sinners in need of grace. Isn't that amazing? 
They're, they're there ready to, to lift up the stones and execute her for her sin. And Jesus kind of points out the fact that they are sinners in need of grace. The perfect judge, Jesus, declares them guilty and they ran away. They ran away. Now, the reality is because we're sinners, by the way, if you don't realize you're a sinner, join the club, okay? We're sinners. All of us have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. All of us are guilty. None of us is without guilt. None of us is righteous, not even one, okay? So sinners make lousy judges. Do you, do you realize that? We make really terrible judges. Uh, and when you understand grace, it reduces your desire to pass judgment on others because you're aware of your own sin and how desperately wonderful and necessary is God's grace for you. Pharisees didn't realize they were sinners. They didn't realize they made lousy judges. They didn't realize that they were evil because that's what Jesus was calling them to do. He's calling them to repentance. Some here today need to understand the grace of God. I just got to ask you, do you understand God's grace? Do you understand God's grace? If, if not, then uh, this story is speaking to you and you need to find yourself in that place. Because some need to understand God's grace and some need to be surprised by God's grace. Uh, the woman was not expecting to meet Jesus that day. Um, she wasn't planning on God interrupting her life. All of this was a surprise. And not a pleasant surprise, by the way. She found herself being ang angrily dragged from an intimate encounter and cast into the most humiliating and dangerous place she'd ever been. And by the way, she was guilty. She was guilty. There was no protest. There was no declaration of innocence. Her silence is her confession. She doesn't even try to argue I don't deserve this. She knows the law and she knows the penalty is death. And maybe she was already resigned to her fate. I mean, maybe her life was so horrific, she was okay with the outcome. It's like, just get it over with. And it is often at our moments of complete brokenness that God surprises us with grace. It is often at those moments when we are completely out of hope that God shows up with grace and shocks us. You know, when the, uh, when the addiction is completely out of control, when we've been arrested again, when we are broken by the death of a loved one or a divorce or betrayal, when the doctors have bad news to tell us, or when you just really can't see any reason to live. Suddenly, surprisingly, we can be confronted by the miraculous, the incredible, the overwhelming grace of God. And I say that because there are lives in here who would stand up and testify right now if we had time to talk about how God showed up when you were not looking for him, we're not expecting him, we're not wanting him. The woman stood there, guilty, condemned, waiting for the final chapter of her pain-filled life to play out. And suddenly she's asked a question. Jesus stands up, says, woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? I mean, she's there because she's being condemned for committing adultery. She's there on her way to her execution. And Jesus just says, where are they? Does, does nobody condemn you? And she looks around, surprised, and says, no one, sir. And then she heard what I think must be the most beautiful words in all of creation. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, God in the flesh, the righteous judge, declares her not guilty. Neither do I condemn you. How incredible, how amazing, how unexpected those words are to her. She's guilty, and yet 
she's declared not guilty. And by the way, this is what grace looks like. This is why we all need grace, because this is what it looks like. The one who has the authority to pass judgment on her refuses to do so. The one who can cast the first stone doesn't pick one up. By the way, that's consistent with what Jesus taught. John chapter three, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to surprise us with grace. So some of you today need to be surprised by grace. I mean, maybe your life is hopeless. Maybe it's filled with shame. It's guilt-ridden. Maybe you've experienced so much pain and loss and sorrow that you just wish the misery would end. God refuses to condemn you in this moment. God is saying to you, I don't condemn you. Even though you're guilty, even though you've failed, even though you've rebelled or defiled or disobeyed, God says, no, I don't condemn you either. And maybe you didn't come here today expecting your life to be changed, but right now you just feel like God is calling your name and you've had this encounter with Jesus and he's offering you grace. He is literally saying to you, hey, I will forgive your sins. I will make you new. I will give you hope. And you're surprised. You're shocked. And the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? And what are you going to do with grace? because he's offering you a second chance. So some need to understand grace. Some need to be surprised by grace. And all of us need to live in God's mercy. All of us need to live in God's mercy. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, if you actually believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you already understand God's grace. You've understood that God uh, sent his son to die for you and you said, yes, I want to be forgiven and you received God's grace. You understand God's grace. You, you're, you've accepted God's grace. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that heaven is your home. So once you understand it, once you receive it, now we can live in God's grace. We can live in his mercy. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Go and from now on, sin no more. I, I like it another translation a little bit better where he says, go and leave your life of sin. Go and leave your life of sin. By the way, in case you missed this, Jesus grieves our self-destructive behavior. Okay, when, when you are caught up in sin, when you are caught up in destruction, God is not angry. He's weeping for you. He's grieving for you. He's broken for you because he's offering you the gift of life and you're choosing death. He's offering you hope and you're choosing despair. He wants us to live free because of his mercy. So he invites us to follow him into a blessed life. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It says, okay, I'm not gonna do what I want. I'm gonna do what God tells me to do and that's gonna lead me to blessings and I'm gonna experience life in its fullness. That's why Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He's like, I can give you this if you will follow me. And we do that in two steps. At least I see these in the story. The first one is we give mercy to others. We forgive people. After all, who is the one forgiving people in the story? It's not a trick question. It's Jesus, right? Neither do I condemn you. Yeah. Who, who are the people who are condemning people in the, the lady in the story? The Pharisees. Right. So let me, get, let me just go ahead and paint this picture. When you hold on to grudges, when you hold on to bitterness, when you are unforgiving towards somebody, who are you following, Jesus or Pharisees? Yeah, but we're Jesus followers, right? right? So if we're gonna follow Jesus, that means that we forgive people. You know why? Because forgiven people forgive people. When you've experienced the grace of God, you pass on the grace of God because that's what we do. I mean, if you've ever been that woman in the spotlight where everyone's condemning you and you experience the grace of God, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna forgive other people. 
You know why? Because you know how terrible it is to be condemned. If you've ever been that guy that everybody is piling on and saying you're a loser and you can't do it and they've given up on you and yet God has redeemed your life, you know what you're gonna do? You're gonna give grace to people. That's what it means to live in God's mercy because you've received God's mercy, you're gonna forgive other people. So forgiven people forgive people. You need to remind yourself of that often because it'll change your life. If you want to live in God's mercy, you've got to give mercy to others. And then secondly, you have to choose a path of blessing. Go now and leave your life of sin. Right? Go your way and sin no more. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you want to equate it. This woman was forgiven and she was provided a fresh start, a new beginning. Okay, I'm not condemning you. This is grace. This is mercy. Now you get to start over. You get to start a, a new chapter in your life. Choose to follow Jesus to blessing. Now, here's the crazy thing. We don't know if this woman began a new journey or returned to her old self-destructive habits. Don't have a clue. Doesn't tell us in Scripture. It's a little bit frustrating, isn't it? I want to know the rest of the story. It doesn't tell us the rest of the story. It tells us this crisis moment, and then it moves on. She has to decide what she's going to do, and that's us. You have to decide what you're going to do. By the way, I think the woman changed her life because how do you have that kind of encounter with Jesus and go back to the slop? Amen. It's possible because some of us have visited the slop from time to time, hung out there for a while. But if Jesus has changed your life, you are free to choose your path. One path is following Jesus. That leads to life. One path is doing things your own way, and that's going to lead to destruction. And maybe if you framed all of your decisions every day in that contrast of where is this leading me? Is it leading me to life or is it leading me to destruction? We would choose better. I know I want to choose better. I want you to choose better because when we choose life, it's where, that's where it leads. It leads to blessings. It leads to hope. It leads to forgiveness. So choose to lead, live in God's mercy. And if Jesus hasn't yet changed your life, if you haven't yet surrendered your life to Jesus, ask him to forgive your sins and make you a new person, what are you waiting for? I mean, really, what are you waiting for? I mean, we just talked about the grace that God gives. And, and just imagine yourself as that woman who's been caught, who's been shamed, who's been accused, who's been condemned, and now God is saying, hey, I refuse to condemn you. Go and live a different life. Right now is your opportunity to choose Jesus and choose a different life, choose a different path. And, and it just begins by you saying, hey, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you to change me. And then you surrender to him. You just go, forgive me of my sins. I belong to you. The book of Romans, the apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And, and if you make that decision today, if that's like what's on your heart, would you just do one of three things? You can do all of them, but just at least do one of them. Our prayer team is gonna be right here at the front after the service. They would love to pray with you and talk with you about that decision. I and other pastors are gonna be at the Connection Centers. We would love to talk with you. If you come up and just say, hey, today I surrender to Jesus, we're gonna rejoice. If you can't do either one of those, grab one of those Connect cards and put, I surrender to Jesus today. We wanna talk to you this week. Your priority one. Because we want you to discover freedom in Jesus Christ. We want you to understand what it is to receive grace. We want you to be surprised by the mercy of God. And now we want you to be able to live in it. Because it's the only way you're going to find true and abundant life. Jesus wants to forgive you. He wants to change your life. He wants to fill you with joy and love. But you have to say yes to the mercy of God. God. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. You offer us mercy when we deserve judgment. You offer us hope when we deserve despair. You offer to rescue us from our own self-inflicted just prisons that we have created around us. And God, today we just simply say thank you. 
Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for offering mercy. And God, I pray that every person in this room would open up their hearts to the mercy of God, would understand it, would receive it, and would say yes to you as Savior, as Lord, as a light, leading a life of blessing and hope from this day forward. So God, we're yours. But we can't do this without you. So give us the courage to say yes. Give us the courage to follow you and give us the faith to not quit no matter how difficult the battle seems because you've already won. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Man, that's a great message from Pastor Chad. It's important for us to understand the level of God's grace. Sometimes I feel like we're surprised by it. I hope this message on the woman at the well encouraged you and helps you reflect on God's grace in your life. To hear more from Calvary, I invite you to visit our website and sign up for our Word for the Day daily devotionals. To do so, please visit calvaryaz.com forward slash Devo. That's D-E-V-O. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.